Thank you for being with us, Congressman. Um, and this is such an important and a timely discussion, I think, given uh, the state of play right now with policy and, and crypto. And Dave did a, a great introduction of you. Um, what, I guess the first question I have for you is, given all of those priorities that were listed, given your various committee assignments, what attracted or what is motivating you to prioritize digital assets right now? I've been focused on a uh sense of economic concentration in certain parts of the country. The middle class and working class in America have lost 25% of wealth since 1980, while districts like mine have, have thrived, almost $10 trillion of market value, Apple, Google, Intel, Yahoo, Cisco. Uh, and one of the challenges is how do we create economic opportunity in places that have been left out from globalization? I believe that digital assets is one part of that solution because it can help decentralize economic opportunity uh, and financial access. And so from my vantage point, uh, it is a, uh, an, an, an arrow that we should be using in this challenge of economic disparity. And you see that, too, in the adoption rate and some of the stats that we've seen with crypto. You know, there, there seems to be an uptick in non-white folks using, um, utilizing crypto. Uh, Congressman Auchincloss touched on this uh, with respect to the partisanship of Congress. Uh, one of the things that struck me as we've continued to have conversations about Bitcoin and crypto and uh, digital assets broadly is it remains nonpartisan. If, we, if I look at the handful of bills that you have either introduced or co-sponsored, there's also a pretty strong roster from the across the aisle. So when you think about um, why people approach this this issue or, or these issues, what what do you think makes it nonpartisan, and and what do we do, need to do to maintain that nonpartisanship? It is nonpartisan. I mean, Tom Emmers has been a huge supporter. I don't know if he's ascended to leadership, if that's correlation or causation because of his support of blockchain. We could say, yeah. <laughs> we can say <laughs> but, that. But, okay. uh, you know, he's been great to, to work with, as has uh, uh, Congressman Thompson and others. Uh, so this is an area where it doesn't cut uh, in simple ideological, uh, along simple ideological lines. I mean, there is, uh, there, there are both sides, people on both sides who want to make sure that the next generation of blockchain technology development happens in the United States. That there is, of course, sensible regulation, but that that regulation is not uh, over-inclusive. Uh, and that we are uh, allowing people to have access to uh, the technology that can lower transaction costs, that can make remittances easier, uh, that can have self-executing uh, contracts, uh, so I, I don't think this is an issue that is particularly partisan. So some of the loudest critics of the space that we hear are from the Democratic Party. And as a member of the Progressive Caucus, as a member of the, the Blockchain Caucus, what, what is the progressive case that you make for digital assets? How do you continue to, to educate your colleagues but also recruit them to be allies with you? Well, there's a distinction between technology and financial regulation, and I think often it is conflated. It's impossible, in my view, to be against blockchain. It's like saying you're against uh, the internet or against the phone. I mean, blockchain is a technology. The question then is, uh, how do you uh, best regulate that technology's adoption uh, so that it is in the benefit of everyone? And sometimes I think some voices just come off as, as if they're against uh, the technology themselves, technology itself. Now, if you want to have a thoughtful conversation about regulation, we should. I mean, I think the algorithmic uh, coins and uh, are probably are in need regulation because you should have reserve requirements in dollars for stable coins. Uh, we should make sure that there are sufficient there's sufficient transparency in. Uh, in in these in, sta in stable coins and in cryptocurrency, but I think we should approach it from a fact that there is value uh, in in the technology, as is evidenced by the adoption 
uh, and evidenced by so many of the use cases. And I think you touch on this too in your book too, that the adoption and the development, it's important that we keep this in the US. Um, so I'll come back to that in a second, but I wanted to get, get your take on um, what's happened over last week, but also what's been happening in the market for the past couple of, of months actually. Um, does, does this uh, activity make it harder for you to advocate for uh, regulatory, regulatory action or um, good policy, or do you feel like um, it's, it accelerates and creates a sense of urgency for us to um, take action? I think I, I also read once you said, you know, crypto's here to stay, but we need sensible regulation. Where are we now given what's happened with the market? Well, I think there's definitely going to be a call for regulation in terms of uh, stable coins and reserve requirements for them and uh, a skepticism of uh, algorithmic stable coins. Uh, more broadly, I mean, the, obviously what's been in the news, it, the, those seem to be things that probably are covered by uh, existing law. Uh, it, you know, you have fiduciary responsibilities to people who, uh, you in, who invest with you and there are regulations of what you can do with that investment. Uh, that happens to be whether you're in a car business, a technology business, a, 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 an agriculture business. Now, if there are particular places that need to be strengthened because there were loopholes, those should be examined. Uh, but to me, that seems more about uh, financial regulation and ensuring that people have strong fiduciary responsibilities uh, to uh, th their investors. Uh, and less to do, in my view, with the specifics of blockchain technology. And you were um, uh, one of the proponents of addressing some of the deficits of the infrastructure bill with respect to the broker definition um, by co-sponsoring the Keeping Innovation in America Act, which I think came up in the previous conversation that will address uh, the way that it was drafted, that, that definition was overly broad. And you're also uh, a lead on the um, Digital Commodities Exchange Act. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, Bill? I've been very impressed with Scott Benham, who's at the uh, CFTC. The, and uh, that bill basically says that we need to have uh, a lot of our digital uh, assets regulated as commodities. It doesn't say that we shouldn't have certain things regulated as securities. Of course, there are certain uh, cr currencies that are securities, and those should be regulated as, as securities. But right now, there is almost no regulatory certainty. And what we need is certainty. Those that, uh, assets that are not securities should be regulated by the CFTC. Those that are securities uh, under a Howey test that is adapted for the digital aid should be under the SEC. And that is, I think, one of the, the certainty, I think, is what is uh, most needed. Uh, in terms of the overbroad definition that the Infrastructure Act had. I was just saying that, you know, software developers uh, should not have know your customer requirements. I mean, yes, you should have know your customer requirements for people who are engaged in uh, dealing with the transactions, but not people who are doing the software development work. And I think that was just a case of people not understanding the, the legislation being over-inclusive. And that education piece is so important and I think folks that are working um, on the private sector side with crypto policy are are that's uh, priority one let's try to close the education gap but uh, as evident by the the infrastructure legislation I mean it's just hard to keep up and so are there things that we could be doing better uh, whether it's communicating with more members of Congress what can we do to accelerate that education and uh, allow for more exposure to uh, what's happening in the space? I think it is uh, talking to members of Congress, having uh, human faces of people who are benefiting uh, from being in the blockchain space. The biggest thing, I think, is to talk about the use cases. How is this making people's lives better? Is it that you can remit money uh, overseas without transaction costs? Is it that the money can be moved faster uh, and in ways that are more secure? Is it that you can do, have functionality like sports uh, tickets that can be more easily shared if you have season tickets? What are the use cases uh, that exist? And then uh, what are the use cases for people who are invested in blockchain and why are they invested in blockchain? 
in terms of the, the access. I think the, the human stories, talking about that more, talking about it in terms that uh, members of Congress can, can immediately understand the impacts on their district uh, are important. And one of the places I keep pushing folks is uh, there has to be a clearer articulation of use cases. I mean, Paul Krugman writes a uh, op-ed every, every month saying there's no use. And I often send it to my friends, and they say, oh, Paul Krugman doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, that's not enough of a response. There needs to be, here are the four or five use cases, and to take the criticisms seriously, and then to say, here's why uh, that's wrong. And I don't think that there's been enough of an articulation of that uh, yet. And so that would be my one constructive suggestion. So one of the things that we hear uh, when we meet with offices, well, let me step back. Policymakers and I'd say regulators are their remit is not necessarily to be to think about the innovation. It's protecting consumers. It's it's protecting the market and maintaining uh, or making sure that the U.S. maintains a healthy and robust capital market system. So you so they go into this conversation um, wanting to know how the tech works, and we enter into the conversation wanting to show the merits of that technology. But right now there seems to be this tension uh, or, or that there's not a safe space right now for maybe some individuals to, to lay out their product and say this is how it's benefiting consumers or this is how it's benefiting investors. SEC Commissioner Peirce, uh, for a couple of years now, has been suggesting some sort of safe harbor where you allow for uh, that safe space where, where firms can come in and articulate the merits of the tech and regulators and policymakers can get up to speed in real time because there seems to be a, cat or a deficit there. What are your thoughts on, on a safe harbor? It seems reasonable to me. I mean, on the first time hearing of the idea, but the uh, idea that you should have a safe harbor if you're voluntarily going in to the SEC uh, to talk about your product and to get guidance from them, uh, and to, especially at a time of regulatory uncertainty, uh, seems like a, a reasonable thing that we do in other in other contexts. Exactly. And uh, right now, the uncertainty I think is what's most challenging. If the we can debate whether the rules should be stronger or weaker, and that often gets debated in Congress. But no one should be for uncertainty. Uh, it, it's almost better to have rules there, even if they're too stringent and then can be revised, than no rules. And so what you've had, because of this uncertainty, uh, where, for example, the SEC has said a lot of things could be securities, but they don't want to approve uh, exchanges on securities uh, because it isn't right now a security, you just have sort of uh, a, a ambiguity. And the biggest thing that I talk about when I talk to, to the administration is uh, let's have uh, predictability and rules and let's try to carve out what is the SEC's jurisdiction and what is the CFTC's jurisdiction. Uh, I don't have all the answers, but there has to be some answer to this. And when you think about um, the limited days that we have for the rest of the year for, on the legislative calendar, do you see any crypto legislation moving, and then what do you think is on the horizon for 2023? We've got new members coming into the House and the Senate. Uh, I think, you know, a cohort of folks are are on the record as being pro-crypto, so hopefully you'll have some more allies as you continue to, to move forward. What are you ex expecting heading into next year and for the remainder of this year? Well, lifting the debt ceiling will be good for anyone in any currency because we don't want the U.S. markets to crash. Uh, so I view that as the, the most urgent thing that we have to do and get a budget passed. We're going to try to have the fix uh, in the infrastructure bill, uh, the, the, the fix which is uh, over-inclusive of software developers, to try to get that through perhaps in the omnibus budget. But that is a hard lift, and I don't want to over-promise. Uh, and then next Congress, uh, when we have uh, more uh, people who understand blockchain and, and crypto, and we have two years to work on it, especially that first year, hopefully we can get some of the low-hanging fruit. So we saw the administration lean in with the executive order earlier this year. Um, and this this topic has, uh, it touches so many other issues, uh, as was evident by the scope of that executive order, energy, geopolitics, financial inclusion. As you look at what the administration has done, um, is there anything that you would do differently, or do you think we should lean in more areas uh, with respect to um, whether it's 
competition, making sure that this stays in the US? Are, do you have thoughts on the administration's approach? And if you were in that seat, how would you approach this? I think the administration's approach has actually been quite good with the executive order. I mean, it was uh, thoughtful, it prioritized jobs, it prioritized uh, the, uh, the need for uh, regulatory certainty. It wasn't lost on the administration. I think that 60% of people who owned some form of cryptocurrency voted for the president, and that uh, that is something that uh, is not a demographic that is going away. I think the question now is where do you get from the executive action uh, to uh, the implementation? And obviously, look, the president has had so much on his plate from a war in Ukraine to uh, the, the energy issues and inflation uh, that uh, this probably needs a little bit higher priority uh, in sorting out uh, and implementing the executive action. So my instinct, I think the president's instincts on this are right. The, the White House's instincts are right. And they really need to now drive that with the agencies as opposed to letting the agencies just fend for themselves and the White House not weigh in. And so we're going to hear from folks outside of the U.S. who are working on policy. Um, to what extent do you think out non-U.S. activity is driving U.S. conversations in the policy realm, for example, in Europe or the U.K.? I think we're aware of them. I think we're aware of them in the sense that we don't want to lose uh, the blockchain industry uh, overseas. I mean, we want to make sure that we are uh, still the most competitive uh, place for the development of that technology. And I do think the administration uh, is aware on that. Of that. On the other hand, you know, as some of the recent examples shows, there, there are reasons we have regulatory frameworks in the United States, and our regulatory frameworks, in my view, are the best in the world in terms of balancing innovation with consumer protection. There's a reason why most wealth is in the United States, why the United States currency is the reserve currency, why people line up to come to the United States. So we should be mindful of other countries because we always want to learn, uh, but ultimately it's for the United States to figure out what the appropriate regime is consistent with our values. So you have a room of folks who focus on policy, but also technologists, and are extremely grateful for the work that you've been doing over the years to advance uh, a more favorable regulatory environment, but a more responsible regulatory environment. What advice do you have for us heading into next year? Because it seems like it's going to be busy. Well, one, I'd, I'd say that uh, the political engagement really matters, especially on technology issues. Uh, and that is uh, something where your participation, your helping uh, share your perspective with members of Congress can make a big difference, especially in an area like this where most members of Congress haven't made up their minds. It's not like uh, a person's views on reproductive rights where you're going to go into a member's office and change their views. Very, very hard to do. But on this issue, most members don't come into it with strong feelings one way or the other, and they may really listen uh, and want to learn. And so I think you have uh, a, a real opportunity. The only other thing I would say, though, is you know many people here have extraordinary resources, opportunity, and I would look at your role as citizens in our democracy at this time, not through just the limited lens of what does this mean for blockchain, but more about what are we going to do to make our democracy more functional? What are we going to do to create more economic opportunity to bring people together? I think it would be uh, a misuse or underuse of people's talent in this room if their only citizen activism was around blockchain. Was there anything that surprised you about this growing political segment um, that, that, that's pro-crypto? I think we first saw had a sight into that with the infrastructure bill last year, and you mentioned the, the segment of voters. Uh, is there anything that's surprising you on the political realm that you're watching for as you, as we, it's hard, it's, can't believe I'm saying this as we're heading into the next cycle of 2024? Well, I, I think what surprised me is uh, how active the community has become in the last year or two on, uh, on in politics, which is a good thing. Uh, how much uh, it suggests, how much this group, in, in my view, is up for grabs. I don't think there's a firm partisan affiliation, uh, Republican or Democrat, uh, and how much it's aspirational still, aspirational about the American dream, aspirational about build, building wealth, aspirational about, about building new technology. 
And that's a wonderful optimism to have at a time that there is so much cynicism and, and, and negativity about the country. So I do think it is a very important group in American politics, uh, and it's important for political leaders on both sides to pay attention to it. So let's end this on a high note. What are you most excited for in this space? It can be policy related or, or not policy related. I would say the opportunity to democratize access to the next generation of technology platforms. Uh, the, the reality is that Silicon Valley, which I represent and very proud of, uh, has been pretty inclusive, uh, exclusive in who gets to participate in the investments, who gets to participate in the development of new technology. A uh, blockchain provides us the opportunity to make the, uh, the, the next generation of technology more inclusive, to have people of color, to have women, to have people in rural America, especially if we're intentional about it. And that, I think, uh, uh, allows us both to diffuse the opportunity, not geographically, but also around race and gender lines. And, and I hope that the next generation of technology, the next generation of entrepreneurs, uh, will be more of a reflection of the country. Well, we certainly appreciate your efforts in Congress and are on deck to help where we can. Please, let's give the Congressman a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for having me.